go. Hi, Steve Gilmore. This is the Gilmore Gang for Friday in March. Thank you. Uh, you can tell that uh, spring has sprung today, and the reason you can tell is because I just told you. <laughs> uh, so uh, I've been asked by uh, TechCrunch Central to uh, tell you exactly what's going to be on the show today. Uh, and uh, not being a mind reader or a prophet, uh, I'm going to fail at this task. But well, I'm sure we'll talk about Apple, Google, Twitter. Uh, what else are we going to be talking about? Microsoft. Microsoft. Mm, nah. Maybe. Uh, Yahoo, well, Microsoft maybe. Microsoft is looking into people's hotmail to charge them with crimes. So, you know. There's that. Yeah. yeah. So this is the new uh, Gilmore Gang where we sneak Scoble in <laughs> before we ask him directly what is going on. Okay, so let me introduce uh, our uh, gangsters today. Uh, starting with the new guy, uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome Samil Shaw. Welcome, Samil. Hi, everyone. Okay, let me have a little level from you. Voice, talk about... Your childhood, while I <laughs> check your voice level. Samil? Oh, locked up. Well, On was, my screen, he's locked up. Baby. Yeah, that was auspicious. <laughs> yeah, I'm there. Oh, good. Uh, interesting happening there with uh, the video. Okay, uh, let me just have a little audio level from you, please. Hi, this is Samil Shaw. And uh, what do you do, Samil? I work on a product and product marketing for Swell Radio, which is kind of like Pandora for news information and podcasts. Excellent. And you are a frequent contributor to Twitter, uh, where I've seen your work, and also TechCrunch, where I've seen your work uh, as a columnist uh, for many years. And it's our great pleasure to have you join the gang today. Thank you. Looking forward to it. I'm really excited. Okay, so that's excited from you. Let's get a, a, a freeze frame of that. <laughs> there, there we go. <laughs> okay. It'll take a while, and then it'll get good after don't, that. Don't worry. I'll get into it. I'll get into it. I, I'm not worried. <laughs> I'm uh, speaking of mindfulness. Uh, Dan Farber. Welcome, Dan. Uh, it's good to be here. Hi. And you are in your book-lined repository? I'm in my book line repository, 300 feet underground. And and how is the, uh, is, have you done your kryptonite sweep yet for the day? Well, I'm just making sure no one's looking in my email and that, um, you know, I can keep the NSA, you know, from poking into every part of my life. Good luck with that. Uh, also joining us from uh, Half Moon Bay is the Robert Scoble. What's up? And Robert, what's happening? Uh, not too much. I, I don't know. I mean, I just got back from South by Southwest and I'm still recovering. Um, and the news this week has been, I don't know, sort of not interesting. <laughs> but I'm sure we'll find something. Well, I think it's been very interesting. Out. Fascinating, actually. Yeah. Uh, that voice uh, belongs to Kevin Marks. Welcome, Kevin. Hi there. Nice to see you. Um, I know. I think it's been fascinating this week watching what's going on with Twitter in Turkey. That's that's um, uh, that has me engrossed today. Twitter and Turkey. Yes. So Turkey, um, the Turkish government banned Twitter and um, redirected their DNS so that it didn't point to Twitter anymore. Um, and half all the people in Twitter on Turkey discovered how to re rewire their DNS and use VPN, and the number of tweets per day um, went up from Turkey because they were um, fighting back against the government trying to censor them. And even the president of Turkey um, circumvented this to tweet about it. <laughs> hate it when that happens. Can't we get our presidents under control? I don't think so. <laughs> and uh, last but certainly not least is Keith Tier. Welcome, Keith. Uh, happy to be here. And uh, with a new ability, I can, I can show what Dan's talking about. Watch this. There is the Guardian on people snooping on your email. Ooh, that's great. 
<laughs> so we'll be right back to the Keith Tier gang after this important message. <laughs> Good luck trying uh, to take over from Tina, by the way. I did want to say I'm totally intimidated by Samil's yellow post-its behind the wall. He looks like a totally organized guy. <laughs> uh, don't, don't believe what you see. <laughs> okay. I'm just trying to plates. All right, so uh, uh, we've we've already heard a topic, but uh, uh, you know, I'm going to resist the notion of of trying to uh, uh, pay attention to uh, the NSA in any way possible, uh, given my usual default, which is to assume that I'm being recorded. Uh, so, other than that, uh, do we have any reason to care about the world of technology today? And I want to start with Samil. Any reason to care about the world of technology? Oh, yeah. absolutely. I mean, if you look at, you know, a macro view of what's happening in the market in, you know, whereas three, four years ago, um, you would have, you know, traditional big VC and growth venture firms angling to pump money into deals uh, before they were about to go public, eight, twelve, eighteen, twelve months. Now they're competing with hedge funds are moving down the stack, private equity is moving down the stack. Um, Wall Street firms are moving down the stack. There's a lot of money being pumped in, and it's unclear um, how secular that is, meaning lasting, and how much of that is artificial. Um, I know that's the right question to ask. I have no idea what the answer is. All right, so when you say down the stack, what is the stack, and uh, how do you move up or down on it? A traditional tech hedge fund, um, a traditional tech hedge fund may... They play both sides of the market, but now they're investing in Snapchat. They're investing in Hotel Tonight. They may be investing in other media companies before they're about to go public. Um, and so there's a lot of there's a lot of new money playing in the late stage game, and it's big money. And, and it started with it started with um, uh, DST with Yuri Milner, who so successfully followed that model when he invested in Facebook at what everyone thought was a crazily high price. And since then, all of the big firms uh, on Sand Hill Road have moved towards growth investing, and now the hedge funds are piling in, um, which is leaving a lot of empty territory in what is traditional venture capital. The, in, in a way, the word risk is now a dirty word again. It's like, put a lot of money behind no risk, don't put any money behind risk. Maybe play the casino gambling tables in the incubation stage. I totally agree with that. Uh, it's all Greek to me. What do you mean by the incubation stage? Well, the stage at, at which my company gets involved, Archimedes Labs or Y Combinator or uh, 500 Startups, which is usually pre-prototype idea, small team, figuring out what to do. There's plenty of money in small lumps that goes into what are mostly highly speculative early stage bets. Um, and, and most of that is not coming from VCs anymore. It's coming from smaller funds, micro funds. There are now 135 micro funds in the Valley. For those who don't know, I'm raising one right now, a $25 million fund. A micro fund is under 50. And uh, there's 135 of them now. Um, and then there's all this huge amounts of money, a uh, billion dollars plus in growth funds that puts very large sums into companies like Secret um, when they consider them to have got, got through the early stage to the breakout growth stage. And in the middle between those two, which is where normally venture capital goes, like you know a $5 million round into a company that hasn't yet got product market fit but has a big idea that would be game changing, those investments are really hard to come by now, unless you're a and, superstar. And Steve going, Steve, going back to your original question, what's important in technology today? The, the thing that's happening is that a lot of people with money are just looking at these secular trends, which I would call... Having a little uh, trouble here with your bandwidth. Mobile, shift to cloud-based systems, you know, potentially shift to new platforms. Um, okay. Should I start over? No, I, I just, are you on a, a Wi-Fi connection or an Ethernet connection? I'm on Wi-Fi, but should I plug in Ethernet? Yeah, why don't you do that and we'll come back to you. Okay, sounds good. Thanks. 
uh, Dan Farber, do you see the 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 this you know discussion about the, how money flow is happening in the valley? Do you see that as any different than what it used to be? Well, the money ebbs and flows according to these different trends, and and you know as as uh, Keith and was saying, you know, there's basically this this movement to making safer bets by piling tens of millions or hundreds of millions of dollars, you know, into these companies that have, you know, gotten into some orbit or suborbit and hoping that there's a huge, you know, payoff down the road. Um, and as you said, it's harder in the middle so that the little startups, they can probably get something off the ground. But if you can't get to stage two, then, you know, you might be just closing the doors sooner than you had thought. But that, you know, that'll change over time uh, and go back to, to where people are seeing success from the VCs in the middle, um, having some, some good exits. Uh, the, the thing that, that we can't forget about is like what we're talking about, the, how the money flows. But the important thing is there's still a huge amount of innovation going on and that this money system uh, of, of uh, you know, early investors, and small investors, uh, VCs, and then the big investors and hedge funds, whatever, you know, it seems to be working in the sense that we're getting to, to a point where there's just, just thousands and thousands of companies trying to come up with some innovations, a lot of copycats. And, uh, you know, forget about the crazy valuations. It's, it's you know, whether, you know, it's a leap forward and, and, and a good transition in terms of a power shift in terms of, you know where where the control points are. I, I I agree with everything except the fact that it's working. Uh, I think there's a, a kind of an unintended consequence of the stage we're at, which is that if you're a, if you're a, a, a first time uh, entrepreneur trying to get funding, you have to kind of fit into a model which is uh, typically a lean startup model where for a very small amount of money you can produce something meaningful in about three months time and with mobile having replaced the the web as the primary development platform uh, the lean startup model is fundamentally broken it, it, to, to produce something for Android and for iOS uh, and possibly a back-end and the web requires a lot more than the old web 2.0 stuff needed in terms of cost and people and resources so lean startup is kind of becoming out of date, but the startup guys are encouraged to do something in three months with a team of two. By definition, they've started to think very small, and most of the me tooness or the smallness of the ideas, and the number of companies even, is actually a symptom of the funding environment, and it's a broken environment that will not lead to the big breakthroughs. I agree with Dan, there's still a lot of innovation, I hope that doesn't go away, but I think that acquihires, which is what happens when you close the doors early, are a symptom of that innovation no longer happening in the startup sphere, but being pulled back into the companies that can do the acquihires. All right, so Robert Scoble, do you see uh, any difference uh, uh, in the kinds of startups that come to you, that uh, engage and interact with you as a result of this uh, uh, apparent. I mean, I'm not sure I agree with Keith, but what Keith is suggesting about uh, drive away from innovation as a result of the uh, the way money is moved around. Uh, you're muted. Hello. Oh, that's wonderful. Ah, sorry, I muted myself. Um. I have. I you know Silicon Valley used to really be all about um, bigger ideas that took three, four, or five, maybe even 10 years to do. Um, and I'm seeing a lot fewer percentage-wise of those kinds of companies coming out and a lot more kinds of companies like Secret that just got uh, funded, which is a very simple idea to implement and can be done in three months and uh, can get a lot of people addicted very quickly and can potentially create billions of dollars of value very, very fast. WhatsApp is a good example. Instagram's a good example. And uh, uh, Secret is a, a new example. In fact, one of the key employees from t Twitter just left today to join Secret. Um, 
the uh, so and I'm seeing a whole bunch of uh, software eats the world kind of startups. You know, uh, uh, things like Uber. I mean, Uber is really a pretty simple idea when you unpack what Uber is. It's a layer of data on top of an existing car service, and um, it, it didn't require buying a lot of new inventory. It didn't require doing a lot of uh, really deep uh, R and D work. Um, it, it, it was it's a pretty simplistic idea, and I think we're going to see hundreds of Ubers come out over the next few years because of this new funding regime. Um, I, I'm missing more of the old school. You know, let's uh, do something that takes some real brains, some real R and D. I mean, that's sort of why I was uh, very hopeful that uh, watching Google do Glass, and why I'm bummed out that I I haven't heard more about it lately. So, all right, Samuel, let's just try uh, yeah. your audio again. Thanks. Yeah, I'm just gonna make two quick comments uh, since I had that uh, audio blip. One is I think you know macro level, there's a lot of money flooding in and a lot of experiments underway. Uh, there's really nowhere else to put the money. There's a ton of innovation going on here. Agree with Dan. Um, and some of those companies are going to be small and maybe they grab more attention. Some of those companies maybe aren't in the valley and or are a little bit quieter. So you see, um, you know, like I think Oculus Rift is a great um, example of a company that sort of took traditional venture capital, took a lot of it, is trying to do something. It's unclear whether it's going to hit and you know maybe they don't get as you know they do get some attention but maybe they don't get as much attention in the valley or it's not mature enough yet um so i just think sometimes like because there's so much tech media focusing on this stuff it can kind of distort what's actually really happening kevin um <clears throat> Well, I spent yesterday at the um, 500 Startups Bitcoin conference, and that was interesting because, precisely because it was a it's an area there's a lot of people putting bits and pieces together, and it has that um, sort of scrappy innovation feeling. Um, but there are people who are thinking about longer term stuff as well. So there, there were, that was that was an interesting set of things to see. There, I saw um, Crypto Corp, who were trying to set up infrastructure that will um, be a legal trust that means that you can use bitcoins without them. Um, but but have a, a, a revocation mechanism and, um, by having three part Bitcoin co commit and things like that. There's some, there were some interesting bits and pieces going on there that that seem like um, structural changes and things rather than just oh I've decided to you know add technology X to thing Y. So Bitcoin is super interesting because you, you can see a lot of very smart people from the finance world and the computer science world poking around. Now, what's going to happen in one year, three years, five years, we don't know. But the, the, there's just a very clear signal that smart people are messing around with the protocol. And I've seen enough. I've made actually three investments in the space across the infrastructure layer, application layer, and services layer um, where I, I just I think that uh, I think Andreessen Horowitz is is metering your bandwidth. Revenue, building a business around it, more so than the other things that we've come to look at. Uh, can Can you repeat the last sentence? Uh, yeah, it broke up. Yeah, I'm. I'm just saying. I think you know, looking at the smart people that are working in the space and they're actually making money um, and building businesses. There's something there. There, um, it might take a while to figure out what it is. And you don't think there are going to be a lot of big losers? Uh, like, uh, didn't well, uh, Andreessen it, lose a lot of money in that uh, a few weeks ago? Well, you're talking about one investing in the currency, which fluctuates, um, is a little more liquid versus investing in applications built on the protocol, infrastructure built to support the. Protocol protocol so there are different kinds of businesses around bitcoin um so yeah you can you can buy and trade bitcoin like a you know like a stock although you can't do it immediately and then you can build around the protocol and build new things so like there's a company i invested in just focusing on smart contracts using the protocol all right uh before i forget uh francine in the uh, uh in friend feed uh, suggested that uh, she's concerned about 
uh, Twitter uh, demolishing uh, at replies. Uh, yeah. I, I am as well, and I, I think that uh, uh, this is, I guess you call uh, Twitter a late-stage company at this point? I, I have a view on that. Oh, yeah, well, everybody on this show can speak yep. simultaneously, so, and then nobody can hear anything. <laughs> so go ahead. So I, I do think we will see Twitter, from a UI point of view, change quite a bit. Um, there's some top-level top, top level reasons for that. One is to onboard new users. The architecture and the way it's set up you know, can take a while to figure out. It took me a really long time to figure it out. Um, you can imagine a new user coming in and the feed being like chronologically based. Um, it might not be relevant to a new user, so they're thinking about you know, that immediate retention and how you get the person back. Um, and you're seeing a little bit in the profile uh, style changes, which sort of starts to look like a Facebook profile. So I, I think we'll see a lot of changes um, to Twitter's interface. But don't you think that they're uh, going to bite the hand that feeds them if they start tinkering with the fundamental social graph that they have uh, enabled uh, and which has not been duplicated by anybody yet? I, I do agree with that, and it's unfortunate because I, I love Twitter. I want it to always be around in the way it is now or has been. Um, my belief, maybe this is sort of an amateurish opinion, is that they can harvest a lot of value from the people who use it all the time rather than trying to play a volume game. Um, but, you know, I don't yeah. know the company. Robert, the, this is the battle of normals versus uh, uh, early adopters, isn't it? Uh, you muted yourself again. Sorry, I, I'm trying to be a good citizen here. Um, it, it is because the value that most people people bring to Twitter is very, very low. Uh, but there are some people who bring extraordinary value. Um, and it, and it, the trick is to figure out how, how to get people addicted to Twitter. Facebook has the advantage of having your personal friends and family on Facebook and that's what addicts you to it because it's really hard to say your personal friends and family aren't important and I'm gonna go and hang out on Google Plus or something like that. Um, with Twitter, none of my friends are on Twitter. My personal friends are on Twitter or if they are, they're very lightweight users. My, most of my family does not post to, to Twitter. Um, and so the, the addiction level is just not even close to uh, what Facebook is. And that's why you're seeing really flat growth, because people don't know why they need Twitter. I do. I, I, you know, I have it streaming down, and I, I see the world's news in real time that way. But most people aren't news freaks like I am. Um, they want somebody to pick one article to show them, you know? They, they don't want to do that much work that I'm doing here. And uh, in, in fact, the, the really positive things on Twitter are these is this new Discover tab, which is a filtered tab, and it's quite good. But how do you get people to put enough signal into Twitter to get that Discover tab to work properly? That's really hard because you have to figure out who, who to follow. And most people don't know who to follow. For instance, if I wanted to learn something about sports today, I wouldn't know who to follow uh, 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 in in the sports world. You know, who who are the journalists? I don't know. Who who are the sports players at the San Francisco Giants? I know I could probably come up with two or three names, but I couldn't name everybody on the team. I I I don't even really know a, a lot more about about the sports world than that, right? And most people are like that when it applies to world news, tech news. Uh, their interests, like my dad's into pottery, so he wouldn't know who to follow in the pottery world. Um, um, so, and so you need Twitter to do that for you. And how do you get the data, enough signal out of people to do that? That's really difficult. That, that's why Facebook is winning, because Facebook is uh, gets people to put that signal in. So, Robert, um, I, I think there's another dimension to it as well, which is it's all to do with the starting point. Um, let, let me just show you a little drawing I do for myself. This drawing is like, at the top right there, you've got Twitter. And yeah. Twitter, Twitter is um, anonymous uh, initially with profiles. Now, if you think about the number of times a day that you want to you do something anonymous, uh, which you broadcast to others, it isn't that many times a day. 
Facebook, it's engaging with friends. That's more times a day. WhatsApp, it's actually chatting with people who are very close to you. It's even more times a day still. Yeah. So I think Twitter's problem is that its, it's starting point doesn't provide enough uh, reasons for engagement for a person to go there or stay there uh, because it's addressing a part of human behavior which is um, incidental and not, uh, you know, not sufficiently high velocity. So they've got to move to, in my little drawing, they've got to move down to the bottom left, which is where it's personal and interactive. Um, they've got to get into direct messaging, chat, maybe even, if they want to have anything like a Facebook. So Samil might be right that they're going to change the UI, but in changing the UI, they're actually changing what it's for and trying to move to a different part of a person's life. One, one note on that, just to build off what Keith was saying, he's absolutely right about the direct messaging. About a year ago, in the UI, on mobile and the web, they sort of deprecated um, how to get to direct messaging. Right at the time when the Valley started learning about all these high-growth messaging companies from Asia, um, so that I just want to underscore that that is, is absolutely right. You need some sort of back channel, and even Secret has sort of productized, um, you know, tweets that people don't want to send. Uh, so it, it's very interesting, you know, the the channels that they're losing by being forcing people to go public without having a verified. You know, most people don't have verified profiles. But, uh, but the, th th the thing that I don't think. Uh, Dick Costello is uh, is fully understanding uh, is that if you if you created a, a chart and I'm not going to do what Keith has done I'm going to just talk about it instead uh, <laughs> if you created a a, <clears throat> a graphic that showed engagement as the prime uh, dynamic the amount of engagement that comes from being direct messaged uh, or, in the case of an at reply, uh, publicly direct messaged, uh, that kind of engagement results in a, in a social graph that becomes dominant in terms of the usage of, of Twitter. It may be difficult to use and to set up initially, but if they, if they tamper with the ability to I mean, right now I use uh, Twitter for direct messages whenever possible, simply because it has the largest number of people that uh, I have established a handshake with. Uh, it's much better than email because email tends to be further down the notification stack. Uh, you also, uh, in terms of notifications, which uh, I've uh, discussed ad nauseum, and, and by the way, Samil's writing on the subject is fantastic. It's one of the reasons that we hooked up in the first place. Um, it, the notification stack uh, creates uh, more ability to be able to control uh, you know, audio cues and various other kinds of ways of messaging the, uh, the interruption of a, a notification than email does. Email is very difficult to uh, there's there are no tools. Gmail doesn't have any real tools to be able to filter in terms of notifications. Uh, if it did, it would be a fantastic uh, advance in terms of the product. But Google doesn't seem to really care about notifications, as we discussed last week. So the the thing that I'm concerned about uh, about this, and also to a certain extent the the discussion about simplifying or uh, slapping a UI uh, on top of uh, hashtags. I, I was never a big fan of hashtags when, uh, what's that guy's name? Chris Messina invented it uh, uh, many moons ago. But uh, it has evolved into a way to keep Twitter honest over the, the last few years. Uh, essentially, it, it allows swarms, and particularly political swarms, to emerge around hashtags, which then migrate into the at reply, at mention environment, where which is much more powerful. So I, I think that, you know, they didn't really damage uh, retweets uh, by their UI uh, layer on top of it because they preserved the, um, uh, the ability to do a quote tweet. 
uh, as a retweet. I, Go ahead. Yeah, you know, I you know I think that Twitter's done really well at serving the users it has today. And at signs, hashtags don't need to go to go away. Um, the one-to-one -one direct messaging they could do more with. Um, discovery they can continue to improve, but that that's not going to give them a huge boost in in new users. The only way they get that is to really focus much more on the curation part, which is if you want to find out what's going on with, with Malaysia Air three seven zero, you can go to Twitter and you can. You know, there are various hashtags you can use. Um, there's a flow going on. You can look at CNN, which is 24 by 7 on it. But what people really want, and to expand it out, is curation, which is, okay, kind of what Andy Carvin was doing in Egypt, which is give me the 10 or 15 best sources who are tweeting on this subject, create a list, and promote it. And you can do that for every topic, for thousands and thousands of topics. And, um, and I believe that's the way to make Twitter more usable and more useful, which is you have all this incoming, this river of content coming in, but it's very hard to turn into something usable from your mortals. And whether Twitter does it or they, or they allow other companies to do it, um, I think that's, that's an important next step to uh you know for twitter to become more mainstream well they're not going to allow uh, other companies to do anything i mean and, that, then they, that seems and obvious. if they don't then they get into something that they've been reluctant to do which was mess with the stream which was so, to anoint people who are more worthy than others and you know to, to take on a more editorial role but without that you know, it's the free-for-all that it's always been, and it, it works with a certain segment of the population. So, for example, if you want to find out what's going on in Crimea or in Turkey, um, you know, some people will sort it out for themselves and find the sources that they trust, and there'll be a community built around that, but that doesn't extend out very far. A um, couple, couple of pieces to keep in mind with Twitter, too, just in what's going on. Um, May 6th, the lockup period is over, so it's going to be interesting to see um, what some of the insiders do. Uh, the stock has fluctuated a little bit, but it's sort of held at around 30. Um, I agree with what Dan was saying about you know making it easier to search real-time events. That's where the value is for a new user. Um, kind of comes back to what Robert was saying earlier. Uh, in terms of you know what Dick may be thinking about, I've never met Dick. I think he did an amazing job getting the company to where it is. Um, he's going to be judged by one number every quarter, and if that number isn't moving in the way that institutional investors want it to move, a lot of people believe that that number is driven by the amount of users. Um, now that doesn't even you know what they've been doing is selling ads against that. We haven't even talked about using cards as commerce, using cards as, you know, gathering information from users. So I do think from a product point of view, without contaminating the UI too much, there's a lot more value to, to extract. I just have no idea which direction they're going to go and how fast. Uh, Kevin, you haven't been speaking uh, much. I'd like to hear you. Much. I'd like to hear you. So um, for me, they've... Yeah, you know, the part of the problem is that they they stifled all the all the um, experimentation by shutting down the APIs that gave us different ways of looking at Twitter, and so we're stuck with what they build now, and that makes it more problematic. The other thing is they have um, they've sort of damaged the original thing that made Twitter work by adding all these extra notifications because you now get notifications of retweets and replies and retweets of replies and favorites of retweets replies and whatever out to three degrees um the actual re responses that you want are, are getting buried in the noise there and that and it and that has a problem which is that um it used to be that the default view of Twitter was just the people you'd chosen to see, and you had to click something to see replies, which meant that it was hard for people to spam you on it. Um, whereas now, any idiot can can at reply you, and it'll get make your phone beep and pop up unless you um, navigate some like three level deep dialog box to stop it. So they've, um, I think they've, um, by trying to sort of trying to make this stuff 
um, more interactive and accessible. They've, they've undermined a lot of the things that made it work in the first place. Uh, I would reinforce that in a slightly different way. I think closing down the APIs is definitely a symptom, but it's a symptom of something else, which is they made a decision a long time ago when 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 Dick was initially put in there by uh, uh, Peter Fenton from Benchmark had a big role in that. Um, they made a decision that they did not believe that a global messaging bus two-way between anyone and anyone that was the essential network glue, if you like, the messaging subsystem for the entire mobile and desktop-based internet was a good business. And they decided very early to focus on content clustering and the attempt to be both broadcast and audience um, in a much more audience broadcast model, a media model. That decision probably meant that Twitter instead of being a hundred billion plus company, could only be a 10 billion about company in the long run. I call it the Yahooization of Twitter. And, and I really think that was a mistake. It was an error of judgment based on familiarity with media models of the people involved N and not really understanding the power of what Twitter was in its first incarnation. Robert? I totally agree with uh, what Keith just said. Um, they <clears throat> they have not figured out um, the secret sauce that's going to unlock the a, a real growth in their users and and uh, and it's sort of sad, you know. We we saw it <clears throat> several times as they mistreated their early adopters and their uh, and their developer community. And uh, they're still dealing, trying to deal with that. I mean, Jeff Sanquist, Jeff Sanquist, who was my boss, got hired. Works at Twitter now to try to rebuild a relationship with developers. Um, I just don't know how you, uh, you know, Facebook is an identity system because they forced real names on people. And yeah, you can fake a name and and get away with it probably now. But most people use their real name on Facebook, and most people don't use their real name on Twitter. And so how do you solve the spam problems for direct messages that keep me from using Twitter for direct messages? How do you, um, how do you build on any system that has more value than it has today without being an identity system the way Facebook is? I, I don't know. Um, if I did, I probably would be working at Twitter, huh? All right, so uh, I guess the consensus, uh, other than uh, Samil, who we're having some bandwidth issues with, uh, seems to be that uh, that they're going to work this out. Uh, I'm not confident of that, but uh, I guess we'll move on. So is there anything else that you think that has been uh, super important in this, uh, in this last several weeks other than uh, the... Uh, continued uh, relationship between these kinds of what? services and the, you know, uh, the political and international world, which seems to me uh, to be uh, becoming more the and first, more important. The first of the big dogs has jumped into wearables. Uh, Motorola, hence Google, just got uh, uh, showed off uh, this new 360 watch, which has a curved screen uh, face and looks pretty pretty damn competent competent so um we're now waiting for apple to jump in the market so we can really uh define the narrative of the wearable space um i'm really scared about where google's going with glass and i wrote a post about it but i uh, i don't have enough information and that's the part of the problem is they're they're being very secretive about what the future of glass is and i, I think it's stupid to do that be, given how public you've been, uh, they have been about about the this product. Um, but I, I really like where Motorola is going with the uh, circular watch, and um, but I, I I can't get one, so we're waiting. Well, I, I mean, you know, I think I think you know the, that uh, you know Google Glass has a lot of problems uh, just because it's so new and different, and but yet it gets incredible amount of press. 
uh, for Google and for the technology for the wearable space. And the Motorola watch, as you said, Robert, it's actually pretty cool, at least on spec. But I think as people have been describing, even uh, Google Glass or the Motorola watch, these are Google Now devices. And mm. I think that Google cares far more about creating Google Now as a platform than it does about whether Google Glass is going to win or they can create the leading uh, notebook or whatever, a phone. It's all about Google Now and what lies underneath it. Dan, we talked last week about Google Now versus um, the alerts notification center in Android versus um, Google Plus. And we were asking the question, what should Google make the center of gravity that it builds around? And I made the point that I thought it shouldn't be Google Now. It should be the notification center, on Android at least. And it sounds like you, um, you are more favorable towards Google Now. Is that true? Or how do you think about that? Well, I just look at Google Now as the representation of you know, how you interact with it. Uh, but it's got to be built on notifications. It's got to be built on, the, on Google's huge knowledge graph. So it's all the and 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 its ability to understand English language, its ability to give you specific answers, um, just like when you're driving your car and you're using Google Now or or, or Siri or anything else. Uh, that's the big data collection. That's the service that's really sticky. Uh, that's how you'll use these devices, and. You know, for Google, it's all, about, it's all about the data in. They have better data in, better data out, better monetization um, to build these, you know, this platform for the future as opposed to, you know, we want to sell watches. Samuel? Um, yeah, just a quick note to chime back in. Uh, on Google Glass, there's a ton of commercial applications uh, one can think of. So the consumer route may be, as Dan was saying, to get a lot of attention for it, maybe they're playing a long game, but you can imagine 101 scenarios for Google Glass in a, in a business uh, business technology context. Yeah, in but Samil, of- that requires you to have a store so you can de- de- deliver apps to people, even if it's only five people wor- working at your company or working Sorry. in a surgery I, room or working as cops I, I, or working yeah. a, on a factory line or something like that. Me, and two, we need to know when, I, when is this going to get shipped out? I'm not... They so, announced it almost two years ago by jumping out of these blimps and making a huge deal about it, mm-hmm. and they haven't shipped. And that so tells I, me something is wrong with this team, because I'm sorry, when you do that kind of public, huge expectation uh, setter, you got to ship at some point. And I, I'm becoming more and more distrustful of this team. So, so I should clarify when I meant a commercial purpose. I didn't mean individuals using the glass or a, or a modified version of the glass that you currently have. I meant more, think about larger panes of glass in an airplane. Think about something in an aquarium. Um, something where Google is powering a visual display that's more dynamic. Yeah, but that, that learning is not going to come from this product, this, this product, you know, Google Glass. Uh, this screen and this OS is too sucky. It, is, it really is a deeply flawed product at almost every level that you go down. Robert, I'm surprised to hear you say that because you were so enthusiastic. I, I, I was enthusiastic a year ago when I got it because I thought that this team was going to iterate really quickly and bring major new functionality to, to us. In fact, they've turned off some of the functionality. It used to automatically uh, upload the photos that I shot to uh, Google Plus where I could uh, uh, look at them on my phone and then push them around to Facebook or other places. I can't do that anymore. It's, it, it, you go through this product at nearly every level. Let, let's, let's, let's just do uh, five of them. Uh, making a phone call. I can only put 10 contacts in here. I, I'm sorry, I have 10,000 contacts. And if I want to call a random person, I can do that on my phone, but I can't do it on glass very easily. Uh, let's go to directions. Directions are really cool in glass. So when you uh, finally get an address in there, 
and you turn your head, the map turns, so you know you're going down the right the street the right way. And and if you're carrying two suitcases, which I usually do when I'm uh, you know walking around a city, um, and trying to go someplace, I, I I can see where I'm going, and I don't have to pull my phone out. Great. Except if you try to tell it, um, let's go to 500 First Street uh, in San Francisco. A lot of times it'll it'll change that to 501 Street in San Francisco, and and you can't. Tell it, no, I mean 500 First Street. Uh, the voice recognition isn't quite good enough, and there's no way to put a cursor in there and correct it. So now I have to go and pull my phone out and go there. Um, let's go to photos. I take a photo. What happens? It, it, nothing happens until I hook it up to power or, and Wi-Fi. Then all of a sudden it uploads to Google+. Plus. But that's not useful for journalists. I I just had dinner with the guy who runs NBC's camera in the White House. He wants to use Google Glass because he's always running, um, following the president, you know, and his big gas camera that costs $150,000 is not always useful in those situations, but Glass would be really good. But that requires you to be able to push that photo to Instagram and Twitter and Facebook and Google Plus and other places. Can't do that. And you and the voice recognition is not good enough and the screen resolution is not good enough. So you can't see the resolution on the, on the photo. There's no way to zoom in and make sure you ca captured a really sharp photo. I, I need it to go down to the phone where I can see it and edit it and uh, and put a tag on it and everything else and push it out. So they're forcing me to pull out my phone and t take a picture instead of use my glass for it. So, um, so and, Robert, and we could keep going for about an hour on how deeply flawed this product really is. They just have not fixed a damn damn thing in this product in a year. Isn't it possible that the deeply flawed thing here was your initial enthusiasm? <laughs> uh, it, it absolutely is. This is like seeing the future. The, the, and I know it's the future. Something on my face is a, a real deep future for us. Is it going to be Google that brings this to us, it to us? History says no. The first one is rarely the one that, that brings it to us. I mean, I, you know, look at the Newton. A well, Apple that's not true. The iPhone. the iPhone and iPad, but it took a decade. The iPhone after, was after the they first. they showed us the Newton, because the Newton had deep flaws, oh. right? And we, yet we were all excited about the Newton because we knew it was the future, or a future, right? Uh, something in our hand was going to be a deep future. We weren't that us. excited and, and, about and that, the Newton. And that is absolutely but proven true. It seems to me that Google is not super interested in this category. If you look at the robotics category, they go off and they spend you know, hundreds of millions of dollars to buy up all these little companies doing robotics. Well, they haven't gone out to sweep up all the interesting companies like Meta or um, uh, Athena or others who which, are which nobody has this nailed space, this space you know, with wearables. Not, nobody's that, shown that me a on product that like, sit across oh your my. eyes. Um, we got to we got to listen for each other, Robert. I'm I'm sorry. When I uh, we've been through this uh, off air. When I talk, I can't hear anybody. Else. I know. I'm sorry you need to do the uh, you just do the thing that I did. Yeah. Kevin has the software switch. You just need to uh, write it into the XML file. It'll help. Yeah, I got to do that. Okay, good. All right, go ahead, uh, Ke uh, Keith. You were saying something. I, I, you know, I was going to say I think there's a kind of a dirty, dirty little valley secret hidden inside here, which. If, if I say it out loud, many of us will recognize, and that is that Google is a broken uh, management team. La Larry and Sergey and Eric are um, not on the same page, even close. Larry's running the show. The X Lab is basically Sergey's toy, where he gets to be happy, but, but you know, not important. And he gets to play with glass and cars and things that have no immediate relevance. And uh, Eric is flying around the world, you know, with uh, friends, in quotes, enjoying himself, talking to governments. And, you know, if you really ask what is Google going to do, the, what you're really saying is what is Larry going to do? And, and I actually think Larry's doing a great job, but it has nothing to do with glass or, or self-driving cars or talking to governments. He's doing a, an awesome job of trying to figure out how to turn a, a company that was built on the desktop from search revenues into a company that is a major player in mobile, and he doesn't yet know where those revenues are going to come from, although he hopes that the desktop model will carry over. I doubt that that's going to happen, but that, that's his current play. So I think most of this stuff is 
really easy to understand if you understand the people and what's really going on there. Samuel, what do you think? Yeah, I, I mean, I wouldn't bet against uh, Larry Page. They have tremendous amount of, you know, revenues, and they can, you know, a lot of people have called them Bell Labs. We don't know, like Keith was saying, when those things are going to come to fruition, but they bought Android, they bought YouTube. Um, there's a lot of value to harvest from those two. Um, you know, someone mentioned to me the other day that if YouTube were a standalone company, you know, it'd be in the tens and tens of billions of dollars. Um, the amount of search happening there, what's happening in TV. So I think they have their tentacles in a lot of things. Yes, are they going to upset people um, with maybe putting one foot in the other before they should have? Yes. Um, but no one can, you know, very few companies can match what they can do in terms of revenue, the talent that they are able to keep. And so I think they're going to make revenues in a lot of different ways and be around for a long time. But, I mean, you know, Everybody seems to be able to go after Tim Cook uh, for, you know, having lost the, the jobs magic, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, isn't it a legitimate point uh, that uh, Robert and others here are making, which is that, uh, you know, they, they get the search thing right, but uh, when they try and when they try and move their uh, aircraft carrier to the next location uh it, it it seems that their management team is is not really up to the job right but okay so let's take tv real quickly right if we just focus on a few products that are out there at massive scale you know people are going to want to watch different things on youtube discover different things on youtube in different ways who's going to power that who's even close to powering that right so right there tons of revenues coming in they're controlling the ad units on the front and the back um so, so that's that's done. Um, if you think about what Dan was saying about Google Now, if a bunch of um, you know, if you fork Android, great, you don't get access to Google mobile services. So the phones that are going to have Android are going to be powered by Google Now. If you assume that Google Now gets better, I mean, they have to make it get better. If that becomes a platform of interaction where people just get information pushed to them, they control that layer. They, if you ask your watch or your glass or your phone where to go eat, they'll know all that stuff and they'll be able to spit back information to you. So just even looking at those two areas, you know, desktop web search type in something, yeah, maybe that maybe that's not the way they do it. But people will still search in different ways. They will search by asking a question. They will search by um, wanting to have information presented to them based on inputs they've already put in their calendar. Uh, they'll want to be able to search YouTube or have things pushed to them from YouTube, and they'll be able to control that interaction. That sounds like Marissa Mayer. Marissa Mayer? Marissa Mayer is, uh, you know, at, at, at Yahoo would like to uh, provide that experience for the Yahoo audience and get out of its Bing deal. Yeah, but the, the what, I mean, I don't think Yahoo is a comp there because their information wouldn't be dynamic. They did buy ABA. No, I, I think, yeah, and I think that's the problem. They're making all these aqua hires. They're doing all this design work. But fundamentally, they don't have the, the rich data that they need to provide an experience like what Google can provide at this point. Yeah, I think it's apples and oranges there. I mean, it's, uh, it's, a, tough, it's a tough thing to figure out Yahoo. Um, there's a lot of theories out there. I mean... I guess they were buying companies, you know, buying talent cheap, trying to change the culture. Um, and, you know, who, who knows how they're going to get their attention beyond the media services that they offer. Um, but they still are operating at scale, so there might be time left to do that. But, you know, the market isn't, the market isn't looking at that as growth in terms of mobile or cloud, right? I mean, it's, uh, it's pretty clear they're not looking at it that way. Okay, uh, we're, we're going to start to wind down now. So I, what I'd like to do is to uh, go around and I want to start with Kevin because uh, you started this uh, conversation with uh, Turkey and Twitter, which seems to me to be uh, a sort of an example of the, uh, the, the real world viral uh, model, which I don't think that a lot of the... Uh, Vendors have really 
understood, uh, but a lot of the countries in which uh, revolution is being fomented understand it intuitively, which is that we have a worldwide information network now uh, with something close enough to real time to allow people to be able to uh, cross borders and uh, political thought with impunity. And it's just completely changed everything. The What I wanted to ask you about is the uh, uh, this spectacle called uh, Flight 370 and how that's being handled by the media. I find it just incredibly uh, pathetic how the news media has been handling this this story. Uh, there was it, it took I think about two hours of nonstop drivel before somebody noticed that the picture that was released of the satellite uh, shot was dated four days earlier. So, uh, at what level are 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 the people that are involved in this real time network? Uh, are they are they really participating, or are they just basically sleepwalking, trying to find uh, a pathway back to their old business model before it evaporates? Do you, any thoughts on that, Kevin? So, sorry, Twitter or Google? Which who's who's? Uh, this is not really about Twitter or Google. It's about okay. the larger scope of things the fact that i mean there are some people that think that uh that uh, the united states government and others already know exactly where this uh, plane is and have for some time but they're just trying to figure out how to launder that information through uh incompetent other countries uh you know at uh, less uh visual detail so that it can be released uh samuel you can so you, yeah. know, you can jump so, in any time yeah. right? That's I'll jump in. So, I, you know, the overall point I think you're making in your question is, you know, why haven't people either in the mainstream media or individuals like an Andy Carbon type um, gumshoed this to figure out what what's going on? Right. And I think, uh, again, at the risk of sounding like an armchair, um, you know, aviation analyst, which is like the hottest new job, right? Uh, <laughs> Right now, and I, I don't have TV, so I don't I don't watch broadcast or mainstream TV. But it sounds like this is one of these odd, very niche cases where you, we're trying. Someone's trying to corroborate and collect information from governments that don't easily interoperate, uh, to use you know te technological terms, so that it would be potentially quite hard for even the hardest nosed journalists or teams of journalists to try to figure this out. But you don't um, see this, you don't see that uh, this information isn't showing up or this conversation isn't showing up on Twitter either. Uh, you know, well, I think it's got more to do with the fact that people don't quite understand uh, the capabilities involved uh, have proliferated to the point where uh, it's far beyond this particular conversation as devastating as it is to the uh, families of the people that uh, pretty clearly did not survive this uh, accident or whatever it was that beyond that there are global characteristics which if you look at it uh, the way that I'm suggesting uh, it has a lot to do with what I think you're talking about Samuel which is the uh, inability of the major players to interoperate in a, in a way that is actually useful and corresponds to the opportunity for uh, rapid growth in this marketplace. Yeah, I mean, I mean, the the most interesting thing I heard on the radio um, was, you know, you know, couldn't we through nano satellites stitch together images and crowd sort, you know, use the power of the crowd to figure out maybe what's happened. Uh, it's beyond my pay grade. I don't. I don't know how to look at that. But if you think about what you know, international laws are around um, maritime laws or airspace laws. You know, it seems like based on the facts that this plane made a turn right in the moment where it was handed off from one government to the other. And I guess it took that split second where there's maybe potentially no incentive between all the other governments to corroborate the information. Um, I eventually think it will come out, 
it's unfortunate that there isn't like a a WikiLeaks, you know, type effort going on. Maybe that'll happen in the future. But as perspective, I think with Air France four four seven, it took a few days, maybe about a week, to find the debris, and then I think it took about two years to recover major parts of the fuselage and and the black box. So right, but I, uh, I think that you you did make the point that uh, the uh, you amplified the point that I'm trying to make here, uh, which is that. It, it is not in their, they don't perceive it as being in their economic interest to answer the obvious question, which is, aren't there a lot of satellites up there that have already, you know, this information, what is the reason that this picture took four days to be processed? The answer probably is that maybe it took a day for them to pull it down from the satellite and discover that there was something there and then disseminate it. But the chances are that there are a lot of other pictures that are already obviously, if you use machine intelligence, are already collecting the information that's being required. But they may not be, just like in Silicon Valley, there may be things that uh, Google Plus uh, would like to do, but which they're not doing because they're uh, you know, paying too much attention to beating Facebook at their game or whatever. You know the proprietary nature of these strategies intermingling. There just seems to be a, a lot of not seeing the forest to the trees well, we about should, we what should, the real opportunity is. We should remember that governments, even though that they're under different types of attack, uh, still hold a lot of information power. I mean, I remember sometime within the last decade there was a Russian submarine, the Kursk, um, that vanished off radar. And the they didn't even tell the families until 48 or 72 hours after, um, and you know sort of resisted outside help. Um, so there there is a pattern in history when a country has some sort of you know extremely unfortunate event where lives are compromised, where there is some security angle to what's happening. Absolutely, and that they resist the urge out of pride uh, for help, and that may have happened here. And, and, and you know, apply uh, that same logic to what's going on here in the technology space around real time. And I think that there's more than a subtle analogy about what's going on here. Yeah, I, again, the, the, the nano satellite side, I just I know that there are companies doing it. I don't know enough about the technology and how it works. And Yeah, I'm not I'm not talking technology here. I'm talking about economics and, you know, the power politics of big vendors uh, trying to steer clear, uh, you know, they're they're looking for some sort of business model for Twitter, and it's staring them in the face every time that anybody does anything in this world. It shows up on Twitter within about ten seconds, and you know, if you look at the zeitgeist of what's going on on Twitter just by watching the notifications of the number of people that you push notifications to, which in my case is around two hundred, it it, invariably, it will tell you that there's not much going on, but which is very valuable information. Uh, occasionally, you'll see some of the more astute people that are out there signaling in subtle ways that, look at what's happening here. This is going to start to build. They will use at mentions and at replies to signal others uh, of that group of people that are interested and and real work starts to get done this is an enterprise eco ecosystem that at the moment is not really served by the enterprise it's served by these consumerized products and you know all the flash and money appears to be in the whatsapp space but behind the scenes there, i think there's a lot going on right now that we will recognize uh, uh, Kevin, do you have anything to add to this? Um, or subtract? Subtract from it. Um, I'm, you know, I think the interesting thing about the flight thing is is people's sudden disbelief that we can lose a plane anymore. Um, it's perfectly, you know, the, the Indian Ocean is a big place, and it's perfectly possible for a plane to ditch it without any satellite seeing it, because the satellites that um, are wide angle enough to see the whole of the ocean couldn't see a plane, and the ones that are close enough to see a plane wouldn't necessarily be covering that bit. You know, there's a, the, 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 you have to have a satellite looking in the right place at the right time for that. Um, 
and if it just crashed in the sea, we're not going to see it. If it's if it's crashed into land, you can probably see the debris a bit later, and that's what's happened with other crashes and things in the past. But it's the um, the interesting thing about this, and the fact that this becomes such a long running story for me, is that it has been um, people's continuous like disbelief that that we, that the entire world isn't under surveillance all the time, and therefore something sinister must must have happened. Um, and that that sort of cultural shift is the, is was the is the slightly shocking bit to me. Is that people assume that everything ha- has been captured and and recorded somewhere, and if it's if it, we're not seeing it, it's been covered up. Okay, great. So uh, let's uh, go around the table and uh, send put this one to bed. Uh, start with uh, Keith Tier. Uh, just happy to be here. The great show and um, interesting. I think we might need to edit out some of my rather honest comments. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, good, good luck with that. You're, you're, you're not going to get invited on the Google plane this this, week, this year, I don't think. <laughs> Neither are you, Robert. <laughs> I I always assume that. <laughs> so that's your summary, Robert. What's that? Is that your summary that you're not going to be on the plane? Pretty much, you know. I I just wish they would uh, uh, focus and finish a product, and uh, can't wait to get the finished product. Dan Farber. Uh, I agree. It would be good to see some products finished. And I will be flying the plane. You will? Yes. Oh, very interesting. You're going to fly? You're going to be up front? Or you'll be flying on the plane? I'm taking up flying, and perhaps I can get a job. Okay, well, we'll we'll do whatever we can to help. Samil, uh, last thoughts? Yeah, no, no, I just had a great time coming on first time and hope to do it again in the future. And I cut out for a little bit, but, you know, the one thought I'd leave everyone with, um, something I've been thinking about, is we talked a little bit about Twitter and Facebook. Um, I actually think Facebook could be on a path to be a trillion-dollar company, despite some of its issues. Um, And it's, you know, I've been reading a lot on the plane of sort of backlog of articles and listening to Zuckerberg's speeches and, I, I just think we're actually underestimating how huge uh, it could be. Well, I agree with that. I think that Facebook in the last few weeks, I've been using it more and more, and uh, I find it fascinating how they've uh, started to aggregate a lot of the real-time technologies uh, in a way that's uh, incredibly useful. It still has the same problems that, uh, you know, coming from my uh, at-reply hacker uh a user hacker kind of scenario uh, I find irritating or downright uh, problematic. But I think that in general, all of these services are maturing rapidly. And uh, I think that's a good thing. Uh, and w- we didn't talk about Microsoft at all. So uh, we'll yeah. have to puzzle what that means in the future. I guess the interesting thing with Microsoft for the future is, you know, how will people respond on iOS you know, to to the software products. That's kind of interesting. Well, there was an interesting uh, post by someone on seen on Dan's uh, uh, former employer, uh, ZDNet, or I'm, I'm not sure who it was, but uh, he had he used a, a copy of OneNote, which was just released for the Mac finally for free, uh, and it promptly deleted all of his uh, office anyway it was a long it's, excuse for like that, yeah. for him saying that he's not going to reinstall office because he doesn't need it anymore so uh i think that they're they're going to be in a world of of confusion as they start to make this move and i think it'll be interesting to see whether the uh, uh whether the microsoft board lets uh, the new guy actually uh, do what needs to be done but we'll find that out pretty soon, quickly, because I understand that uh, Office for the iPad is uh, imminent. Uh, and I'll certainly play with it before I don't use it ever again. I can't, ima- I can't imagine why you would need it. Well, I have gotten along without Office, except for my, you know, at work I use it constantly, but that's because everybody else does. Yeah. You know, but you know they're using Excel and they're using Word and they're using PowerPoint and there are already uh, very adequate replacements for that that uh, that are very useful. So uh, 
I think they're going to have trouble. And uh, I think it's going to be interesting for us. Uh, I, I just saw uh, some sort of uh, tweet. To, very few people uh, are going to be... Charlie Isaacs, you're going to have to write in more compact form so that I can <laughs> scan my notifications rather than having to uh, wait until after the show to be insulted. <laughs> well, it, while we've been talking, Arrington also read a, a post that uh, Google looked at his email um, in the same manner that Microsoft looked at uh, this employee's email. Well, they do it all the time, and they, they run ads against it. They're always looking. Uh, right, but that's an al it's a different thing if an algorithm's looking at it versus uh, it being used against you. Oh, well, the we'll have to read that. That's un uncrunched? It, yeah. Uh, yep. I, I think I saw that uh, on the screen here earlier. I want to thank uh, uh, Salesforce for supporting this show. I want to thank uh, New Tech for... Uh, being incredible with uh, their technology and uh, we're very very interested in wiring this up to some of the software that we're building for the show as well I want to thank uh, uh, Ustream for providing uh, live streaming services and uh, uh, we're looking at uh, ex expanding those as well I want to thank our producer and director Tina Chase Gilmore she can't Where's the hand? We have to have an old-fashioned hand. There it is. Uh, and somebody needs to figure out wh why her camera doesn't work. I want to thank uh, our guests today, uh, Kevin Marks. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you. Good to be there. Uh, Keith Tier, uh, we don't see him because he's busy playing with his uh, video toys and the, no my camera went down for some reason but I'm still here okay well thank you for joining us as usual Robert Scoble thank you Unmuted. Thanks. sorry I keep muting so that I don't mess up your audio stream and uh, Dan Farber thanks good to see everybody and Samil Shaw yeah, thanks for having me. I had a blast and hope to do it again. Yeah, well, I'm sh I'm sure you will if we can uh, get the uh, technical bugs uh, worked out. Yep. I want to thank I'll do it at my apartment next time. <laughs> Why do you have better bandwidth there? I I might. Cool. Uh I want to thank uh the chat room as always. I want to thank uh Mike Arrington for being Mike Arrington. <laughs> and uh <laughs> I mean, there's just nobody else like him, and uh, it's a privilege to know him. Uh, I want to thank... Uh, Are we allowed to say after that? What? Are we allowed to say, thank God there's no one else like him? Well, you... In a good way. <laughs> Luckily, I don't need to say that. <laughs> See how that works? And uh, I want to thank uh, uh, everybody who showed up, and especially those who didn't. We'll see you again next time. Bye-bye.